Shall we roll? Roll. Rock and roll. It's up. Actually, we're a little, we are being booted at uh, 515. Um, uh, first, a couple announcements. First, to pick up on something Carl mentioned in passing, um, one of our participants, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one of the participants who canceled the last moment. He is a colleague of Rad Byerly's, Roger Pilkey, Jr., who is a uh, policy analyst, a policy scientist. And um, while uh, Rad has uh, done an admirable job to bring the policy per, uh, perspective uh, into this conversation uh, just a few moments ago and, and then ac across the last two or three days, um, no one can match his persistence. And so it's, it's, it's a shame because I do think that we would have had a more full-bodied um, policy perspective if Roger could have been with us. Uh, second small procedural point. Uh, this was, of course, a research workshop which w that is going to issue in a, in a manuscript. We're looking for manuscripts from all of you. Um, we have a June 1 target date for you to get ma manuscript to Gene and myself. So. Um, please do that, uh, if at all possible. <coughs> Rather than a talk... Uh, Tom, do, do you have more guidelines on manuscripts? Lane? 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 Uh, um, Lane? Gene, what would you say? Big news, yes or no? I'm willing to go with what I call natural length. Yes. How about three? Th how about three to six thousand words? Is that that's pretty broad? And figures, yes. <coughs> so. Figures, yes. Mandatory, optional. Optional, optional. Uh, I'm calling what I'm doing here wrapping up. Uh, I I don't have a, a a set presentation. I have pieces of a presentation. Um, I, I'm will try to. I've been taking notes for the last two days, and I'm going to try to respond in a way to the conversations we've been having, partial in two senses of the word. Uh, I'm not going to respond. I, I could not respond to all the uh, thoughts, comments, and uh, patterns of conversation that we pursued. It will be also partial in the second sense that it will reflect my own partial uh, view in the world. Uh, uh, so I don't mean to offer this as a synoptic uh, summary. Um, so parts of this I will freeze. And, uh, of on and parts of it I will read from some things I've started to write up for my own paper for this volume. This workshop was based on a question. What types of knowledge are necessary for us to think if we're going to think well about the exploration and possible settling of outer space? For 50 years there have been two <laughs> dominant answers, hardly questioned. On the one side, we need science and technology. On the other, politics and economics. The first set, science and technology, possesses knowledge. The second set was the expression of subjective values and democratic will. The thesis of this workshop is that there is another type of knowledge necessary for having this conversation, that possessed by the humanities more particularly by philosophy. This involves a claim that I want to be clear about. There are types of knowledge or expertise other than scientific and technical knowledge. Ethics, aesthetics, political philosophy, metaphysics, etc. are areas that you can actually know something about, or so the thesis goes. Put another way, philosophic and humanistic perspectives is something quite different from soliciting public opinion. Often these two are resolved in one another. We, if we want to talk about ethics and values, since ethics and values are all subjective, then we just survey the public or we can get a random sample of the uh, public. I'm making an epistemological claim, a knowledge claim, that there are uh, actually other types of 
expertise or of knowledge. If we had more time, we could parse how the notions of expertise within philosophy and the humanities are different than the sciences. Be an interesting discussion. But at least for a first cut, that's the claim I'd like to make. That is, philosophy and public input are different things. This contradicts what I think s should still be called the positivist orientation of culture. And by positivism, I mean a philosophy born in the 19th century which saw the only positive or real knowledge as that knowledge which is produced through science. Now, in this conference, our research workshop, the perspective that I've just outlined, that philosophy and the humanities have something significant, and in fact, I would say a signal to the conversation about space exploration. Within this conference, this perspective has gone by the name of environmental ethics. Now, I'm okay with that term, for after all, we are talking about the environment, our environments, extraterrestrial environments, and there are, of course, ethical issues to be thought in the outer environments. But there are a couple other additional points worth noting. First, the term environmental ethics carries some connotations of animal rights that I don't think is particularly helpful for the conversation that we've been trying to have. And second, as I noted, have noted on a couple occasions, I believe it unnecessarily limits what philosophers bring to the conversation. And so, let me suggest that a full-bodied notion of the philosophic toolbox would include all of these areas, but not only these areas a concern with rhetoric, that is, how, how do we shape our speech or what kind of examples do we use, and the relationship between our style of speaking or the types of examples we use and the logical construction of our arguments. More on this in a second. Secondly, epistemology. Epistemology is one of those 25 cent words that only epistemologists, I guess, know what it means, or philosophers. Uh -huh. Uh, episteme in, in Greek means knowledge. Epistemology is what everyone in this room does. The scientists are epistemologists. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. How do we know? How do we know that we know? How do we demonstrate to others that we know? What counts as knowing? That's in philosophy known as epistemology. Aesthetics is an account of beauty, and I should say it is a philosophical or rational or reasonable account of what counts as beautiful, not a sociological one. It was such a shock to me the first time I taught 15 years ago an aesthetics course. I had a full house. Oh, I was delighted. A full house of undergraduates. But then I found out that they wanted to share their feelings. Ooh, don't you love this? And oh, don't, don't you hate that? And they were really quite upset when they found out that the point of this course was to see if we could rationally adjudicate what counts as beautiful. They were appalled because they knew, while they valued beauty, they knew it was all subjective. A philosophical account of aesthetics, well, brings up this point and it demands an epistemological account, but a philosophical aesthetics is an aesthetics which tries to come up with, with rational, or I think better said, reasonable able to be reasoned about accounts of what counts as beautiful. So, for instance, is a terraformed Mars more or less beautiful? Live question. Metaphysics, difficult term these days. It sounds like we're talking about putting, uh, what, quartz crystals around her neck or sleeping underneath the pyramid uh, or putting our razor blades inside of pyramids to sharpen them or something. It simply means asking fundamental questions about the basic nature of things. Again, more on this and on. Phenomenology is an account of our lived experience, something I think is very, very important if we're going to send explorers to places like the Moon and Mars. I will come back to some of these examples in a moment. <clears throat> Philosophy of science policy asks 
questions about the relationship between science and decision making and about the production, the relationship between the production of knowledge, let's say scientific knowledge, and its use by decision makers or, or stakeholders groups or the public. Political philosophy, I think I don't, uh, we can pass by. Hermeneutics is a discipline of philosophy, which I think I'm, I'm amazed it's not taught to every MD in every uh, uh, medical school and to every scientist. Hermeneutics means a theory of interpretation. And every scientist has to be trained, is perforce trained in hermeneutics, learns how to properly or powerfully interpret data. But I bet, I wager, most of the scientists in this room, while they practice this every day of their life, have never run across the term, which is to say they've never entered into the systematic account of how this is done and how this is done well. Hermeneutics, philosophy, science we can pass over, ethics uh, and metaethics have, at least the first of SIRS, has uh, um, been pri quite prominent in our conversation. Metaethics is asking about the grounds of ethics. Metaethics, uh, every ethics is grounded in a certain orientation or attitude or interpretation of the nature of the reality, the nature of human nature and things like this. And so uh, ethics itself, I would argue, is a derivative, not important. I don't mean that in the sense of not being important, but ethics is itself a derived, a derivative phenomenon. It's derived from a political philosophy and a metaphysics, a sense of what's real and what's most important and what are the basic characteristics of, let's say, human nature. It's okay to interrupt, you know. And I'd like to expand this. This is not about philosophers. This is about humanists or humanists and artists. Uh, the skill set that I was just mentioning very quickly in passing is not something that, which is the possession of, of philosophers. Um, um, it is more something that people across the humanities and the humanistic oriented social sciences are constantly engaged in. Note for a second that this philosophic or humanistic uh, toolbox includes um, aspects such as a sensitivity to, sensitivity to metaphor and symbol, uh, a deep a historical perspective, um, an awareness of sociological context, uh, and as well as issues of justice and equity, and artistic skill. Uh, uh, Bill Hartman gave us a wonderful example of that. So what I'd like to do here is, uh, in the time remaining, is try to flesh out some of the points I was just making concerning a possible, possible, uh, what, philosophical toolbox. And I'd like to begin with an image that David shared, um, shared with us this morning, yesterday? Oh, no, this is back at the museum, wasn't it? Oh, I was thinking. Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, you did share it with some of us, in any case. And I thought this is a wonderful image, and I, I thought your, your, uh, your description of this, David, was evocative. Um, you offered two possible interpretive frameworks for this. One was as, what, dune buggies going across a desert area, you know, some kind of wanton and then the second was wagon wheels, right? No, the second was uh, the, the tracks left by the first creature that, that crawled onto land oh, in the right. ocean for the first time. Uh huh. Right, and then there was. And, and, the wagon wheels the third. and then, yeah, that's right. Then you cited a friend who. Jim Bell who took this picture. Jim Bell who took the picture said it, it he made him think of wagon wheels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful account, but I, I'd like to highlight, if I if I, that that literary critics, for instance, are masters at interpreting how images, whether we're talking about verbal images or visual images, can shape an argument. This is rhetoric. This is the rhetoric of, of a metaphor or of an example. If uh, you would have shown this picture, which is another, I mean, both of these are objective accounts. 
They, they are both, let us assume, uh, accurate pictures of what it really looks like. Uh, this looks what, nice, almost straight lines leading off into infinity. There's a kind of nobility here, right, that, that strengthens the argument of someone who's poor, uh, pro-exploring. On the other hand, if you put up this image, it looks a little bit more like wanton or someone might say someone's, someone was doing wheelies, yeah. evidently <laughs> here. Yeah. And so it's, it's these kinds of issues, right? Being sensitive to context, to be sensitive to the tacit metaphors that are being used in argument. These are the, this is the, the kind of things that humanists, let's say film critics and literary critics, spend their life thinking about. And if NASA, any other agency would like to be more self-aware of its message, how it's shaping its message, dare I say as well, more honest in how a given image is shaping a conversation. That is to say, if NASA would like to be more acute on the relationship between rhetoric and logic, these are the kind of skills that, that literary folks might bring to. Bob, Bob, I have a question about sure. that. Sure. In the first quarter second, that picture, I had a very different reaction. My reaction is here they did something. Yeah, it's right there where they're studying something and learning something. In the other right. picture, they're just going somewhere. Right, yeah. I mean, that's what science is about. It's what happened at that spot. Which is itself interesting. So what's the point here? The point here is not to suggest this is the real image and David's is somehow a fake. Okay? And it's just either that the wanton destruction doing wheelies is the right interpretation because you just came to this with another set of backgrounds and orientation and you highlight it. Well, wait, now it's stopping, it's turning, it's reconnoitering, it's being thoughtful, right? Now, having a conversation about how these different interpretations work and, and let's say we had an environmentalist, a not very sympathetic environmentalist, in the room who would throw a slide like this up, okay, in order to beat you folks over the head. It might be nice if you had someone who had as part of their skill set an articulation of how interpretations are made to point out how you can see this in two or three or four different points of view. Not so we lead someone to a good hermeneut, a good film critic never gives you the one right of a poem or a film or whatever else. Rather, they try to expand the possible interpret uh, universe of interpretations. That's, a, that's an act of freedom. That's an act of, of social responsibility and freeing. And so the point here would be to become more self-aware of the interpretive frameworks we bring to bear to whatever we're looking at. Yeah. One Mars year later, you won't be able to see either of those sets of trucks. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a reasonable point to make. But I also think it's reasonable for, for someone to say, the point you just articulated is not some kind of bare datum or fact. It is a fact that it may, let, let us say by hypothesis, that the wind will carry all this away. But if someone's concern is the purity of an environment, it doesn't matter. It may, it may reasonably not matter to them that this will be fixed or wiped away or, or, uh, or, or non-existent in five years because their concern may be we want to keep an area utterly pristine from human contact. And if that's the criteria that they're bringing to bear, then the fact that the wind's going to blow this away or we can go fix it, this, these are questions that the philosophy of ecological restoration. What is lost, it's asked, if we can, re let's say by hypothesis, we can go into a mined area and completely restore it. Robert Elliott has argued that what we lose is the genealogy of the place. There is an, a, not a physicalistic difference necessarily, but an ontological difference and a genealogical difference. It is no longer a virgin or untouched.
Now, I'm not, I don't even want to defend that point of view, except to say I think it's a thoughtful point of view that will resonate with some folks. Go back one slide. I think that's the opportunity uh, back shell uh, in the distance. That, that's going to be there for millions and millions of years unchanged. So this image, in all, in all its beauty, actually has something that will be perennial uh, compared to these tracks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's yeah, and not, maybe not. and so let me turn around the, the let me reverse the kind of direction of my argument here to make the point. We could show these two images in an environmental ethics class or an environmental philosophy class where we're talking about aesthetics, and people might begin by saying "ugh" to this and "ooh" to that, and then we point out through a combination of the last two comments, actually, this is the thing that's going to remain is going to blow away the other. Again, the point isn't to lead us to one conclusion or another, but to articulate a certain framework for meaning, a framework for understanding. Let me give you another example that came up here the last day or two. Um, I've, we've heard on two or three occasions the phrase that life is better than no life as a kind of principle. Now, a phrase that way, it's kind of Say no, actually, I'm I'm for no life. <laughs> but a rhetorician might say, well, that's one way to construct it. D doesn't it remind you a little bit? Someone might say, well, are you pro-life? Are you pro-abortion? You know, that's again, you can phrase the conversation that way, but it shapes it in a certain way. Are you pro-choice? Are you anti-choice? Again, there's something that's evoked here. There's um, meaningful or thoughtful here, but it also shapes maybe in a jaundiced way the conversation. What if in, instead of saying life is better than no life, we would say letting things alone is better than imposing our will upon them. So what do we have here? We have competing dicta, right, concerning what we should do about Mars. If we put it in terms of the framing of life or no life, the conversation gets led in a certain direction. If you frame it in terms of letting things alone is better than imposing our will upon it, well, you see my point. Except that I reject that too. And you want to explain, or should I go on? No, go ahead. Uh, oh, I just want to say, uh, you, you, people may, may say, we messed up Mars. Don't forget there's 160 million square kilometers where you won't see the tracks because however little rovers haven't been there. Stunning, amazing beauty. I mean, it's not just the tracks. It is the permanence of that back shell. That, that here on this world so far from us, we have left this, this tiny trace of our, our being. This is just as evocative as, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Lucy's counterpart's footprints across the Great Rift Valley and that in will Africa. be a historical park someday. Yeah. Now, let me do the burden of my argument here. I'm trying to widen the consideration beyond environmental ethics to environmental philosophy, in fact, to just what philosophy the humanities and the arts might be able to bring to mission agencies such as NASA. In fact, Rad, I, I didn't get a chance to, to make, this in, um, make this point in response to your talk, but your basis thesis, basic thesis I'd like to, to uh, pose a question to. You said an agency as much pressures and as defensive as NASA is, is not an agency that has time or concern for environmental ethics. I wonder whether it would be better to turn it around, that an agency which is having as much many difficulties as NASA may be having, let's say by hypothesis, is an agency which needs to become more adept at these humanistic kinds of concerns. This is a way to rally. This is not something, not an, if we look upon these of philosophic concerns as an added burden. Who's got time for them? We're all overwhelmed all the time. But if we see this as a possible tool to mitigate uh, problems and to increase our, the efficacy of our communication, then it might be something which is a helpmate. Let me shift to beyond rhetoric and logic. And I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to open up a certain space for conversation. Let me turn from rhetoric 
into epistemology and hermeneutics. I've defined these briefly. I'd like to remind you of the debate that we had with Clark on the occasion of Clark Chapman putting up Rusty Schweikert's line about what's if, what do you call it, Apophis? Apophis, if Apophis hits on April 13th, whatever the date is, it, it will happen. It, it hit along this line. You might have noticed that the conversation for a few moments really diverged in terms of disciplinary orientation. At least a couple of the philosophers here just said, I don't believe that for a second. And the scientists said, oh, this is as deterministic as, as things could be. This is just basic, unproblematic uh, celestial mechanics. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to say a word for why the philosophers might respond that way and open up the possibility of having further conversations about this. Uh, to speak only for myself, I would not see this prediction as a fact, but rather as a combination of deterministic laws and observational data. I would furthermore suggest that the data, that all data, is fundamentally interpretive or hermeneutic in its nature. Thus, this prediction is a prediction which is a combination of determinism and, indeterm and indeterminism. A combination of determinism and indeterminism is not something deterministic. So if there's something to this claim, okay, that if we're going to give a full-bodied account of this prediction, we have to see it as a combination of deterministic laws plus observational data where there's always margins for error and, and, and degrees of interpretation. The problem here is not simply epistemological, not simply that you might be wrong. The, the issue might also be political, that when scientists talk like this, they oversell the circumstances. Because when scientists make claims like this and then they have to backtrack, they find themselves in an uncomfortable uh, political or sociological situation. As I allow me to continue running through my uh, brief laundry list an eye on time. We have about 20 minutes here. Uh, I, I turn to maybe what is my most difficult task uh, over the next few minutes to give a defense of what I would want to call metaphysics or phenomenology. Let me do it by way of a story or an analogy. Imagine that I'm going on a trip from Texas to California and I want to tell you about this trip. And so I describe, describe the vehicle that I'm going in, the car. I tell you how many seats it has, the amount of trunk space, the engine size, the reliability or duplication of its parts, the, oppor the opportunities for refueling and repair along the way, and the choices of food or restaurants that can be found. What's missing in this account? A reason for why I'm going on this journey. Now, I forget the gentleman's uh, name that stepped in for uh, Brett Drake, um, but I, I, this occurred to me while we were listening. I'm sorry? Andrew, who, who did a, a uh, more than serviceable job, a laudable job, uh, working through Brett's uh, PowerPoint. And I also hasten to add that I don't to criticize this. I thought it was fascinating. I, I, could have, I could have asked a thousand questions about this. This is very cool stuff, very practical, uh, very engineering oriented. Let's, let's take a problem, let's deal with it. Let's get down to, to brass tacks. But what I find amazing about these co such conversations is the focus upon means to the exclusion of ends. Or let me put the point a little differently. There's this odd, at least to my mind, odd uh, unbalance or asymmetry between the tremendous amount of thoughtfulness that goes into the means of our society and the paucity of our thinking about ends or uh, the articulation of ends. This is not something unique to the space program. Uh, you see it in cell phones. You know, uh, my daughters have just taught me recently about how to text. You know, my, I discovered that
One daughter rang up a $329 <laughs> bill for the month, and thought I, so I thought it was time to go find out something about this. So I, uh, I, I struck, I struck a yeah, yeah, no kidding. I struck a deal with her where I gave her a discount if I could watch her text and watch the back and forth. Right, I gave her a 50% discount in this. Um, she agreed readily. Uh, I found, to my relief, not so much uh, sexuality. Um, or uh, anything scatological. Um, the utter stupidity of the conversation <laughs> is what was transcendent. It was, huh, what are you doing? Huh, yeah, ain't that cool, huh? You know, it's, <laughs> we have this, this instrument which has how much intelligence embedded within it used for what stupid, nonsensical ends. You know, whether we're talking about, I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, you see this with TV, you see this on the internet. I'd like to suggest this is, this is a ubiquitous problem of our culture. What the, Mar what the philosopher Martin Heidegger, in a wonderful 1952 essay called The Question Concerning Technology, d defined as being the leading characteristic of our time longer know how to talk rationally or reasonably about goals or purposes or ends, we've given up talking about those things and rather we talk about means. Microsoft had an advertisement a few years ago where the tagline at the end of the advertisement was, where do you want to go today? Again, a pure mean, it says we don't know where you want to go, that's a personal subjective decision. But wherever you want to go, we'll get you there faster. I'd like to suggest that I don't mean to, I do not mean to imply that NASA is, is, is particularly guilty of this. But I'd like to suggest that going to Mars is a striking example where we have, where, where, where you all are in the midst of working out the technology, the means to get there, while there is a, a paucity of accounts of why we would want to do so. Here, when I ask these questions of my scientist friends, of my planetary scientist friends, <coughs> is usually a description in terms of scientific interest. But again, what is this phrase, scientific interest? This is something which is thrown, or scientific curiosity. This is something thrown out as an answer when it should be a question to be raised. What do we mean? scientific interest. If we're talking about individual scientists, their psychology, we're going to come up with a wide range of answers. Fame or beauty, you know, they're interested in, the, in learning more about the beauty of the universe or the beauty of differential equations. Maybe something as simple as paying their mortgage. You can imagine all the kind of answers that, that scientists would give like the rest of us would give. Logically, however, to suggest that this phrase, scientific interest, well, at least in the mind of philosophers, if I may generalize, this is, the philosophers will argue that the nature of science is intrinsically or inherently tied to identifying causal mechanisms, natural laws, or statistical probabilities. Again, there is a line of thinking on this topic where philosophers of science claim that scientific knowledge is by its very nature controlling. The idea of a lab experiment is, the, is where you control all the parameters, you vary one at a time and you repeat the experiment until you're sure about the results. That's the gold standard for what counts as truth or as knowledge in our culture. Yeah. reductionist approach and that's why the molecular biologist in their attempt to get more and more precise at the molecular level level are missing things by not looking at the whole organism or the populations or the yeah. environment you yeah I, 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 I agree with your point yeah yeah I, I am uh, I am leaping from mountaintop to mountaintop here your points well taken uh, I
like to suggest that A, or I would even argue if I had more time, uh, th these are a series of assertions really. I'm trying to paint a landscape more than anything else. But I want to argue, at least speaking for myself, that the predominant orientation of science is as controlling. And what's, what is more in my interest today is in terms of finding causal, uh, identifying causal mechanisms. But, but science is not the reason we're going to Mars. Ah, uh, precisely we're going my point. To Mars because President Bush gave a speech which is called the vision. Well, I mean, it's in a cultural context and so on. But yeah, but what, what if I suggested that that idea w may well die on the vine, oh, yeah. but, it, but if it dies in the a vine, it's because it does not resonate with the American public. And if it does resonate with the American public, it, th then it will have political lames past, what, 21 months from now when, when it's office. And so the point here is, yeah, I'd, I'd, at least let me, uh, let me affirm the negative point that you made, if not the positive point. The negative point is that we're not going there for scientific reasons. I'd like to suggest we're going there for phenomenological reasons, though that language is itself arcane to almost everyone in this room. People, if we go to, if, if we go to Mars, I think that what people are going to want to more, know more than anything else is, what's it like to walk on another planet? Now, an account of that is not going to be a causal account. And what we will be asking for, asking scientists to do, is a non or extra scientific task. They're going to be asked to play the role of a philosopher or humanist or ar artist or poet, right? And so it was, we have this weird asymmetry. What people are going to want are are things which are descriptive in nature when science, least arguably by its very nature, focuses upon causal mechanisms. People are not going to be particularly interested in the causal mechanisms. The reason that if we will go to Mars, if we go, is not in It's great if we understand something greater about the nature of the universe, but if we do that, or about Mars, but if we do that, the main upshot for most people, the people who are far this mission, will be the beauty, the awe, and the wonder that such an adventure expresses or embodies. Beauty, awe, and wonder are the categories of aesthetics and metaphysics and theology. And so I wonder about this odd asymmetry we have, where we have mission specialists in geology and astronomy, let us say, whereas the part of the mission is something aesthetic or philosophic or theological in nature. Please. Appreciation for what you're saying, but I have to say I think the first question people will ask, and this is what they always ask me, do you think there's life there? Is there life there? I, I think that's what people are not, what's it like to be there, but is there life there? And that actually has more of a causal, <laughs> the causal connection. And the about thinking about science in terms of philosophy, what's so different about space science is that it's a, it's a historical science. When you start asking questions about origin and evolution right. and future, it's a historical science, which means you can't reduce it to something you can take in the lab. And that's part of what raises so many issues for yeah, people. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I affirm your point. And, and, and let me say that, that the suggestions I'm trying to make here, while they inevitably sound like a work project, a program for philosophers and humanists and artists. <laughs> I'd like to suggest two things. First, uh, they're motivated by the attempt to make better use of NASA and have it better achieve the kind of goals that I think society wants for it. Okay? And secondly, all the points I'm making, I hope they are not being taken as either or, but rather both and. This is disciplinary approach to planetary exploration that I'm advocating, where we, yeah, of course geologists and astrophysicists and astrobiologists have really cool things to bring to the table. But it seems to me the glaring gap here is to bring people who are actually trained in these other areas, in the humanities and the arts, to express much or maybe most of the reasons 
deeply interested in such adventures. I'm almost done, and uh, then we'll open this up to conversate further conversation. Does anyone have the mic, the handheld mic? Uh, I think it's right here. Yeah. Right. It's uh, well, I I should stop here. Let me uh, let me very quickly go through the rest of my uh, slides here. Um, I'd like to finish to talk about uh, with an example. Uh, what I take to be an exemplary example, a paradigmatic example of how artists and geologists, humanists and scientists can work together um, in an exhibit uh, funded by the National Science Foundation four or five years ago called Ancient Denvers. Uh, this was led by a paleontologist uh, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Kirk Johnson. Uh, Kirk, uh, while he's a paleontologist, also has a page, uh, has a BA in philosophy from Amherst and has a wonderful inter sensitivity to the intersection of the humanities and the sciences. Um, what ancient Denver's was about was looking at all the various strata in the Denver Basin or, the De or the, that part of the central Colorado and asking how can we imagine or envision what the world really looked like in the Cretaceous or the Jurassic or the Pennsylvania. And so they hired professional painters to work intimately with geologists to go out into the field to study the rock formations and to turn, this is the Pierre Shale, and to turn uh, accounts of this into images such as that. To turn landscapes, this is the uh, Denver Formation, um, uh, late tertiary, um, into pictures such as this. And we don't have time to go into today, but what is fascinating here is to see how the philosophers had to become poets, geopoets, and the artists needed to help the geologists imagine landscapes 60 or 80 or 2 or 300 million years gone. And so to me this is an exemplary model of the kind of work that philosophers, humanists, artists and scientists can, uh, can do together. And so, with that, I'll turn to my last slide. Um, I have only one real recommendation. <laughs> Put trained artists and humanists on space missions. And I made this argument in brief form in EOS in 2005. Thank you. Uh, I don't think this is... No, no, no. I'm too old. <laughs> if I may, on science being controlling. I'm sorry? On science being controlling. I think there's yeah. a very important aspect in which science is exactly the opposite of controlling. Yeah. In an experiment, we try to control all the variables except one. And the goal is to make sure we have absolutely no control over that remaining variable so that we find out what nature has to say about uh -huh. that variable. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's interesting. Science and engineering have opposite directions in one regard. In engineering, you want a given result, and the person who is buying the product is not that concerned with how the product is put together as long as it achieves the result without any bad side effects. That, that's other people's business. But in science, what we really have to buy is the process, the technically correct process, and we have to not care what the result because the universe, nature, is telling us what the result is, right. and we don't want to prejudice it. Yeah, so it's a kind of controlled uncontrolling, where you, you let things manifest themselves yes. under controlled conditions. Fair enough. Uh, though, while I want to affirm your point, um, a, a contrast with field sciences such, in ge such as geology, I think, is instructive. Because uh, if, if you go out in the field, if you're working on, you know, Cinemanian age rocks and, you know, and southern so uh, the in, in you have a few outcrops, you know, squished rocks from 92 million years ago. There is there is a, such a striking lack of control that lab science can look like very much a controlled situation. That's not even to speak to something like a computer model where everything is remarkably controlled or by definition controlled.
Yeah, I'd argue that there's a whole range of natural sci of, of historical sciences, astronomy, cosmology, ecology, geology, paleontology. Can't, I'd like to pick up on that point at all, um, and also to touch back to a question that we talked about yesterday. Since what you're talking about by bringing the humanities, the arts, the philosophers, and others is almost a historical one, look back on it and bring additional um, insight additional perspectives into what you're doing. And right. so the scientists do what they're doing, and um, we should be respectful that there are other ways of looking at it. Great, right. I like that. And the scientists are going there with that same kind of awe in seeing what's up there. And there, it, it's from a science perspective, but there's that also, that, right. that spiritual touching, and if you will. Right. So that's really neat. But all of those are almost a a snapshot in time or a retrospective look. And what we're sitting here doing is saying, we're looking forward. Where do we get the information to make the decisions about the shoulds involved? Um, I can appreciate how much philosophers and historians and others can bring to the table when we're discussing these things. And I wonder if I am inappropriately hoping that the ethicists and philosophers would come and sit there and be a decision for us or with us. And so that's what we're looking for. Almost, I think the scientists want to go ahead. And the engineers will build it. And we will go there. And we sort of feel that it's OK to do it, barring any kind of wholesale destruction. But we want the validation, if you will. Right. Or maybe to be defensive, we want to be able to stand up and say, it's OK. And we've talked to the philosophers. What do you say about that? You come up with questions, and I'm looking for answers. Is that a problem or something? we? Boy, uh, it's a hard question for Friday afternoon, late Friday yeah. afternoon. Uh, yeah. Hey, you called the conference. Come on, tell yeah. us. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, I th l l let me be straight about it. Philosophers are better at than asking questions than giving answers. Um, I happen to think that asking good questions is a high art and an important skill. If you can ask a, a question in the right way, then you yourself. Uh, rad was rad, you know, the kind of stories about a billion and a half wasted there. And if you, if you ask fundamental c questions carefully, I think that's an incredible gift to, to a project. Um, but I, look, I, I walk around and, and, and upset people all day long because I am in some sense a troublemaker, but, right? But they want to go forward, yeah. right? And I want to say, hold on, let's think about this first before we leap ahead. But the Human Genome Project, for instance, ethicist and they sit there, medical ethicists help right. people go forward. Um, well, that's an you, interesting example. Do I think we have the equivalent of it in this kind of area? Well, that, that's, that's an, an, an active area of research for me and, and a lot of my colleagues. I think that the ELSI program, the Ethical, Legal, and Societal Implications of Science and Technology, rooted in the Human Genome Project, was largely, not entirely, but largely a failure. I think we need to find better ways to integrate the humanities and the arts and, and the, the qualitative social sciences and the social sciences in general with science, natural science and engineering. I don't think we know how to do this yet. It, it has taken us a long time to figure out how to do disciplinary work. Now it's going to take us a whole long time to figure out how to do interdisciplinary work. The LC project I don't think was money that ended up being particularly spent. Uh, a, friend, a, friend of mine, a friend of mine has a different model, what he calls it's time. A friend of mine, give me 30 seconds to wrap. Um, a friend of mine has a model that he calls midstream modulation. The problem with the ELSI program was that it was too far downstream. The work was completed and then the philosopher pontificator or whoever pontificator, the humanist pontificator, just made pronouncements about it. What we need is someone working off the analogy of embedded journalism, let's say in the Iraq war. We need embedded philosophers or embedded humanists, people that will actually work on an, in an ongoing fashion with scientists and engineers. From the, dis right. from, the, from the framing of the problem to the f throughout all the way to implementation and the delivery of some kind of results. That to my mind is a much better model. 
model for how to draw out something useful from the contributions humanists can make. So we should put a line item, you know, PI, humanity. And, and you know, that's actually what is, and, and we are actually to a remarkable degree moving in that direction. You take something like NSF's second criterion, or the fact that the National Land and Technology Initiative has set aside 3% of its budget. Um, uh, Chris was saying to de facto something like that is happening increasingly within NASA as well. We're working this out. That's why, why did this meeting get funded after all? There is a, a dim but growing apprehension that we need to work out ways to integrate ethics and values and a policy perspective with the scientific and technical perspectives if we're going to give the taxpayers their money's worth. I think we're out of time. <laughs>